Before leaving, please remember to make a contribution to all of my uh, thousands of hours of work uh, uh, here, uh, PayPal, Patreon, or fundraiser in the description below or on the China Rising Radio Sinoland art article page. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. This is Jeff J. Brown, China Rising Radio Sinoland, and today I have a very special guest on this show, someone near and dear to me. In fact, we were neighbors <laughs> for almost uh, uh, a year in uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand. How are you doing, uh, Eric Arno? Fine, thank you. How are you, Jeff? I'm really glad to see your face. We've talked a few times uh, since we came back from France uh, to France uh, uh, last uh, July. And um, uh, so I, I do want to let everybody know Eric and I are very good friends. <laughs> I think it's been several years now. I think he found one of my articles or something on China Rising and was nice enough to reach out to me. Um, and Eric's a real people person, and, and, and he reached out to me, and we started establishing a, a dialogue, you know, a, an email conversation. And then um, uh, my wife and I moved to Chiang Mai, and Eric lives there, uh, along with Godfrey Roberts and Richard Miller, and, and, uh, and so we all became kind of friends, and, and uh, we got to spend time together and have meals. So I miss those meals, Eric. I miss those good... I miss those great right. Thai meals. <laughs> and, they, uh, and the restaurants are still open. Yeah, uh, they, not here. We, well, we just heard that uh, uh, there's a new, more of an outbreak now. It's like another wave of COVID. But uh, in Chiang Mai, for the first time in months and months and months, is under restriction. But they are allowing restaurants to stay open, not not bars and Clubs. Some other things, yeah, right. clubs, but yeah. Uh, restaurants at least are open. Yeah. Well, listen, the reason uh, for all the friends, fans, and followers of China Rising Radio Sino Land out there across the globe, the reason Eric and I are together today is because um, I had read Richard Miller's um, um, uh, stoic uh, book, The Meditations by uh, Marcus Aurelius, and as I was reading, I was going, you know, I'd love to get Eric on the show so we could talk about Stoicism and Buddhism because, as you're all going to find out, Eric said, <clears throat> I was a practicing monk for for a while, and I, I guess maybe even for years. Well, he he'll, he can tell his story, but Eric Eric being very very um, uh, prudent said, I don't think we should have. A show with the two of us on because I don't want to compare anything, you know, Buddhism and Stoicism. They both have they're they, they're they're both wonderful. They both have great points. They both helped a lot of people, but I don't want to get into a sort of you know you know a, you know a comparative type situation. And I think that was a wonderful idea and and very very sensible. And then you came back and said, I, but I'd like I think it might be kind of interesting to talk about. <laughs> The combat, the compatibility of Buddhism with communism, and I thought, wow, now that is quite, quite an interesting uh, idea. But before we get there, please tell us you were a practicing monk. Do you travel to China? <clears throat> you have a wonderful website uh, blog uh, about your time in China, and you wrote a book, which I know you haven't published yet. Uh, about uh, your time as a Buddhist monk, uh, and and I guess you can still cons consider yourself a re maybe a retired monk or <laughs> an inactive monk, but just tell us all about that because it's really really fascinating. I've been all through. I've read your book, your unpublished book, and I've also you know gone gone extensively through your website. So tell us tell us all about that, uh, and um, uh, because I think it will help people understand your knowledge of uh, Buddhism when we get into the comparison or the, uh, the uh, yeah, well, you know, the adaptability of Buddhism and communism. Please, Eric, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, uh, I've always uh, been a kind of a, uh, uh, what can I say, uh, somebody who thinks outside the box. And um, uh, the kind of the funny story, people ask me, how'd you get in interested in Buddhism? I was nine years old, I'm watching television, 
this is in, during the 1950s, and there's this guy who, I come from a typical middle class family, very ordinary family, and there's this guy on this program wearing a beret, and he's got this funny looking cigarette in his hand, which I didn't know what it was at the time, but it was marijuana, and he's talking about Zen. And I'm thinking, Zen? What's Zen? So uh, about uh, five years later, I was in a bookstore. I was in a, in a little corner store, actually, uh, after, after school. And I saw one of those uh, twirling um, book, kind of twirling bookshelves where they have yeah, yeah, romance yeah, novels. Yeah, and Where they used to have those yeah, in the seven, well, the, yeah, the five and dime stores. Right, right, you know, the, with the cowboy novels and the romance yeah, yeah, novels. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. and there's this book called Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. I thought, there's a book about Zen! <laughs> and I think, how did I, why did this memory from five years ago of this totally chance thing, and then I see this book and I go, Wow, I gotta get that book and I read the I see this book and I just go, This is really, really cool. I really like this stuff because it was a window into a world that I had never seen before. And uh I have I'm a kind of a I think I'm a free spirited person. I as I say, I kind of think outside the box, uh, you know, from a positive point of view. You could say I'm a visionary from a from a negative point of view, you could say I'm a black sheep. <laughs> you know? But um, anyway, so I got interested in Zen, and then in the uh, in in uh, university, um, it was becoming kind of more uh, more visible in American culture. This is late '60s, and my last year in college, there was a uh, an interim period between semesters where there was a bunch of kind of new age psychology uh, workshops that were taking place. And it just so happened that this beautiful young woman who was, <laughs> who was the, yeah, right, uh, who was the, um, um, the girlfriend of the guy who had put it on. He was a graduate student, and he, was, he had coordinated this whole thing. She's his girlfriend visiting him from Berkeley, California. And I told her I'm interested. And then she says, Eric, you must go to California, you must go to Tassajara, the Zen monastery. <laughs> and and I didn't go to California just for the monastery, I went to California for her. You know, she's just this gorgeous, just totally gorgeous blonde, and I knew she liked me, and I, I was crazy about her, but I couldn't find her. I just didn't know, I just, we lost contact. Well, but sure enough, I was in California, and I found myself at the San Francisco Zen Center in 1970. And, um, you know, it was a very open place at that time. And, you know, you walk in the door, and people are, are very nice to you. And they say, oh, you want to learn about meditation? It's called Zazen. And I really wanted to learn about Zazen because at that time in my life, um, I was I, I felt burdened both by my... I guess you could say my family karma. I came from a family that had a lot of difficulties, a lot of anxiety and tension and, and conflict. And at the same time, uh, U.S. society, this is 1970, it's, it felt like it was falling apart. Mm -hmm. There were talks of race war with the Black Panthers, the, the um, Vietnam War is going on. And I was so disgusted by capitalism, you know, uh, that at the time I wrote a letter to my cousin and I said, if it's this is a dog eat dog world and I don't eat the flesh of dogs. I don't want any part of this. So uh, fortunately, uh, the Zen Center was there and I became a student at the Zen Center was essentially, if you wanted to, you could be a residential student there and live very, very cheaply or at a certain point you could become a scholarship student work within the community and get us a, a stipend and, and um, you'd be taken care of. So I essentially escaped uh, the whole capitalist, you know, morass uh, for 13 years. And where, and where was the, uh, and, and uh, how old were you when you had this epiphany in 1970? 
Uh, twenty-one. Twenty-one. Okay. All right. Right. All right. So, for, so, so you so you were there for thirteen years. Right till age oh, thirty-five. Wow. Oh, wow. And, I didn't know it was that long. Okay, I didn't understand that. That's impressive. Right, and I was ordained as a monk in 1976, so I act, I practiced actively as a monk, you know, with full monk's robes and the rituals and all that kind of thing uh, for uh, until 1983, 84, and at that point, um, two kind of two things happened. One was there was a kind of a scandal where the, the abbot was seen to be, you know, taking advantage of his position, uh, which didn't feel good. And I also felt that I was being, uh, my, my own personal development was being blocked by being in an institution. I felt I yeah. needed to just get out on my own, face the capitalist world, get a job, make some money, become independent, and then I could continue on my path. So that's what I did. I I, um, I ended up um, first. I went to a, a meditation retreat uh, in Massachusetts, and on the way there, I tore the cartilage in my knee, and I had no health insurance, and I had no money, and I had no job, <laughs> and I had no place to live because I realized I the can't American go back. Dream. All right. I can't go. I can't go back to the Zen Center because it's just too claustrophobic, and I have no job. I have no resume. What are they going? What's your resume? I'm a Zen monk. Oh, that's a great qualification. So, uh, so anyway, um, so there I am at this meditation retreat, and I'm thinking, you know, Eric, you really screwed up, you know. You're, 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 you have this, you have, now you've got a medical debt, which you have no ability to pay. And how did you, and, and, and my family history was that my father died when I was eight years old, leaving my mother to take care of two kids. And she had to find a job and there was a lot of stress. And I thought, you know, if my father had been able to plan, he was only 35 years old and he wow. had been sick. He had been sick for years. So uh, he had uh, Hodgkin's disease and kidney oh disease before that. So okay. he, you know, his adult life, he was never able to really fully function. Um, so I thought, you know, people need insurance. Um, so I got into the, so I went into the insurance business, you know, for, for life insurance and for health insurance. And people think, you know, Eric, insurance. <laughs> and... The, the first the first company that I interviewed with, they gave me some kind of test to see whether you're a good person to be an insurance salesman. And they're asking questions like, Are, do insurance agents have a good reputation in the community? I'm thinking, oh, come on. That would be ridiculous. You know, who, you know, who likes insurance agents? They're pushy. They're, you know. So I, I would, I, I, I answered that as a, on a scale of one to five, where one is they're shitheads and don't stay away from them. Five, they're wonderful. I thought, okay, I'll put down a three. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and um, they they offered to hire me if I took a kind of a, a training test to maybe kind of brainwash me a little bit more, you know, kind of thing. But um, I found a job with with another company and. Um, so I was with them for a year, and I, and I was right. It was just the sleaziest bunch of people. So I quit them, and I, I tried to get into another line of work, and that didn't work out. And then I found these other guys, and I started working with them. They were sleaze balls, And eventually <laughs> I, I ended up with this other company, which has got a pretty good reputation in the United States. I'll, I'll leave all the company names out of it. Yeah, yeah, probably better. And, um, so I was, I was with them for 12 years, and... Uh, they got a good reputation, um, and I think I did help some people. I know that people had filed claims that saved them. One guy had AIDS, and he had disability insurance through me, so that helped him. And, and another guy, his wife died of cancer, and he, he said, you know, Eric, what am I going to do? I said, you know, you just got this $250,000. Just take a sabbatical. Just rest. Take care of your sons. And you know, heal, take this time to heal. So I felt that I was able to do some good there. 
Um, but um, at the same time, it was this, I'm, I'm not trained, I, you know, I don't really feel comfortable, you know, being a salesperson. Um, so um, I, ma I made it, I survived for 12 years with that company. I moved to another company. And at that point, the election of 2000 happened. And when George, and I read the, the autobiography of George Bush, the, the father, and realized that uh, he's a Nazi. He's basically a Nazi. <laughs> his, his father is a Nazi collaborator. Yeah, the, yeah, Dulles, yeah, yeah. the Dulles yeah. brothers, they're Nazi collaborators. The country is being taken over by Nazis. And, um, and then 9-11 happens. A plane flies into a building. First thing that comes into, comes into my mind is Reichstag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, um, so from there, I just thought I got to get out of here, you know. And in 2004, I just thought, you know, I've tried to, I've done what I can to help this country. There's, there's not a lot that I can do. I have my own karma that I have to deal with. I'm going to go back to Thailand and I'm going to go practice meditation in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And so I practiced in Thailand and in and in Myanmar. And then a friend of mine invited me to go to. China. He had been. To, he had visited China. I thought, yeah, China, because China is where, um, where that was that what was where Zen became Zen. Okay. And, see, yeah, Zen, Chan, 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 yeah, Chan, yeah, yeah, Chan, yeah, Chan, because because when when um, Buddhism came to China from India, um, it mixed with Taoism and Confucianism. Mm -hmm. And the, and together they kind of they synthesized into what became Zen in China, and then from there, of course, it went to Japan and Korea and other places, and eventually into the into the West. Um, so there was that aspect of my life, and on the other hand, I had this you know very much anti-business kind of mentality. Um, so for ten years, I was basically traveling around and temple hopping and I stayed in China for um, the better part of seven years from oh, 2000, 2007 to 2014 on my first trip I met a, 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 a Chinese monk and he spoke no English his friend acted as a translator we talked for eight hours straight on our first meeting <laughs> And it was the most, the most in-depth conversation I ever had in my life, you know, where you're talking about politics, history, culture, religion, all these things. And I just like, this is so incredible, you know, that I have this, I've met this guy. So um, they invited me to come back to their home city, Xiamen, and I stayed beautiful with place. beautiful city. I stayed with the oh, I stayed with the uh, with the the monk's friend at his with his family for about a month, and I was visiting, and the the monk was taking me around to meet all his friends because he's an artist, an art historian, he's a fairly prominent artist in in China, and I'm going or I'm hanging out with this guy, and I'm thinking, this is so much more interesting than selling insurance. <laughs> 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 well, I, I knew I knew all about the insurance, and I knew you also said you had a great a great an epiphany when you were at a at a meeting or something, and 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 the guy was basically just saying we don't you know we don't care what you do, just make money, you know all you know just whatever it takes, make money, mm -hmm. and I know that that you said that disgusted you, mm -hmm. and. Um, but I, but I didn't realize you, and I know we, you probably told, uh, you know, probably told me this over a meal or something <coughs> about your pre-insurance days. But I didn't realize it went all the way back to all the way back to when you were 21. So you were you were um, uh, practicing Buddhism all through 21 to 33 years old, and then 35, uh, 35. 35. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's amazing. Well, I, um, I have, and then, used but also, and then, um, so I was in the insurance business, you know, full time. I took no vacations or anything for nine years. I was burning out, and I thought I've got to get back into Zen. 
So I found another teacher who didn't work out. Then I found it a, but through his, um, through him, I met his teacher named Robert Aiken, who was one of the great Zen masters in the United States. And through him, I met his, uh, his one of his main students, who was an excellent teacher. And we're still, I'm not at practicing actively, but we're still in touch, still have a very warm relationship. So, um, so I continued my practice uh, all, you know, basically all my life. And I, although I'm not an act, I'm not actively practicing now, like sitting two hours a day. Um, still, my it's in my in my blood, you could say. Yeah, I could say you know. absolutely. Well, I had you. You were nice enough to send, I think, five pictures of your time in China, and I will post those on the China Rising Radio site on land. Uh, interview page. Getting to the Buddhism and communism um, um, uh, idea, uh, you, when you were in Xiamen, you had an experience with uh, the police chief there, uh, and you all talked about <coughs> Buddhism and communism. Tell us about that. Right. That was a very, um, very uh, pivotal conversation. So, um, somehow I was I was kind of unique, you know, because most Westerners have a very um, Western-centric, you know, uh, idea of themselves and, and Western culture. You've talked about that in your own experience, and I mm -hmm. completely relate to it. Um, and I am like that, too, but maybe not quite as much because I had had so much exposure to, to um, Chinese culture. So I was introduced to the the uh, retired police chief of Xiamen, who was uh, at that time was actively engaged in being a sculptor. And he okay. was doing in, environmental, he was doing sculpture with the idea of promoting environmental consciousness. So I meet him and we're talking and then this other guy comes in and he says, see this guy, he's a, uh, he's a, he's an artist. You know, he's a painter. Well, he's actually a general, but he's a painter. <laughs> Just thinking, what American general or police chief would have any interest in aesthetic pursuits? Yeah. You know, I'm just, this is, this is a whole other world. So the police chief says, well, what do you think of Marx, Marx, uh, Marxism? What do you think of Marx? I said, well, you know, um, I, I majored in German in college, German literature, and I studied um, Goethe, Schiller, Hesse, Thomas Mann, uh, some Kant, Leibniz, etc., etc. The word Marx never even came up. It wasn't even in the syllabus. That's how deep the brainwashing is in American academia. And um, now I'm telling you this now, at the time I didn't think of that. What I said to the police chief was, you know, in America, Marx is considered kind of a devil. You know, he's just plain evil. But from my point of view, what I see is in communism, it's basically treating everybody fairly. It's distributing the wealth fairly. Whereas in Buddhism, the main understanding of Buddhism is you're trying to, the idea is save all beings, all beings, not if, depending on race, color, religion, nationality, it's all, all of them, and without discrimination. And I thought, that's the same as communism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And now, did the police chief agree with you? He smiled, yeah, because it's it's a fact. Yeah, you know, um, and if you think about it, the ways in, and this is also significant, is that Mao and Zhou and Lai uh, had a relationship with a very very famous Chinese monk named Xu Yun. Xu Yun was born in eighteen forty. Okay. He died in 
Unbelievable. He lived, he lived through the Tianping Rebellion, <laughs> which was a holocaust that yeah. killed minimum 20 million Chinese people, possibly as many as 100. And then he lived through World War II, yeah. which was another holocaust. He's a double holocaust survivor. Yeah. And he basically saved Chinese Buddhism from being completely... Um, completely destroyed, and he built rebuilt um, many temples, and he had he had some great disciples. One of whom I met, named uh, Jingwei Fasher, or uh, Jing, his name was Jingwei. So, um, anyway, what, what can I say? You know more about that. Well, um, well. So that 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 was that was a bit of a uh, that was a bit of a uh, um, um, uh, a revelation for you about the correlation between communism and Buddhism. Uh, also, uh, the uh, Dalai Lama is on record as uh, being a Marxist and supporting Marxism. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's a very complicated situation. Um, uh, Here's, this is my reading of it, and I know that people will disagree with it, but this is my reading of it. <clears throat> um, I didn't know it at the time. I only found this out years and years later. I had, all I had heard was that he had fled the communists, the communists were bad, <clears throat> <laughs> they, su they suppressed Tibetan Buddhism, and it's always the bad communists. <clears throat> That's the story that we're all told. And the American Buddhist community has totally fallen for that narrative. Uh, Richard Gere yeah. and oh, all those people, so, oh, the bad communists, the bad Chinese, that sort of thing. Well, it's a lot more complicated, as I've discovered in later years. Um, in the 1950s, after, after the Chinese took over uh, Tibet, uh, they they reassert, reasserted uh, control over Tibet after having lost control when the original revolution, the 1911 revolution, took place. There was tremendous uh, ferment and chaos in China. Then the Japanese invaded, so the situation in China was a complete mess. And uh, from from the you could say until ni from 1911 or even earlier until 1949 when Mao, you know, finally, you know, got control of the country. So he goes into, into Tibet and establishes control. And according to uh, the Dalai Lama's own words, he was very skeptical, uh, suspicious. And then Mao Zedong invited him to Beijing and treated him very, very wonderfully and treated him, he said he treated him like a son and uh, had, a, had a very fine experience with, with Mao and he felt that, uh, and, he had a, and he, he had a breakthrough where he realized, you know, communism really makes sense. This is a good thing. And my, in my Tibetan society, it's, you know, theocratic and it's oppressive and it feudal. really has to, feudal. feudal. Slavery, it, right? It really rape, has to, rape. Right. I mean, the, the whole bit. Right. It really it has to change. So um, at that point, it looked like things would have gone on track, but from my reading of it, and you probably know better than I, um, the CIA came in, and they started right. causing causing divisions causing suspicion, then arming the rebels, it's the same old story. You know, they, for whatever, whatever problems the communists had, they magnify them, they minimize the, the uh, negativity associated with the old Tibetan regime. They're trying to split Tibet off from China, even though the Dalai Lama's had been approved by the emperors of China, you know, for a couple of mm -hmm. centuries. So, you know, so Tibet and China are like tied, joined at the hip, 
-hmm. And the West is trying to split them off. Something happened where the Dalai Lama got compromised. And well, you know, they, his older brother was trained by the CIA in Saipan uh, on, on an island in the Pacific and in Boulder, Colorado. Right. With about 20 or 30 other Tibetans to become um, uh, color revolution. Uh, well, guerrillas. Guerrillas. They were training, uh, they were training they, guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla warfare. And that was the Dalai Lama's older brother, which, of course, the Chinese government would have known all about. And um, but as you said, uh, the other problem is, is, is that the. <laughs> I've done my research, and unfortunately, the Dalai Lama um, took CIA money, uh, and that, you know, is an unforgivable uh, sin <coughs> uh, in the eyes of any country that's trying to maintain its independence. And for years and years and years, it was uh, close to a million dollars a year, and so you know he got he got very very wealthy uh, uh, and basically sold his soul. So that's why. <laughs> Uh, the the brother the they dropped all these arms and weapons you know by parachute you know drop you know parachute drops and his older brother and the rebels you know tried to go but it never it never worked and I, and and actually right. the CIA at the last minute just decided to pull out right but um, well but uh, but they still to this day they haven't really pulled well, out yeah, because they're because you know in two thousand eight they were causing trouble they were trying to. Right. They were trying to oh, right, right. Yeah. so yeah, right um, the Olympics. they never, they never give up. They yeah. never give up. Yeah, I know. That's the problem. So, in my my understanding with the Dalai Lama is, I think, um, you know, in his heart he knows what's right, but he's been basically compromised. Yeah, and, I mean, he's been bought. Right, and uh, he probably didn't quite understand what was going on, but. That's what happened, and yeah. um, I've talked with one of his students. There's someone in Chiang Mai who's a who's a, a close student of his, and she teaches here in Chiang Mai. And she says he's been, from all she saw, he was completely non-political. Politics never ever came up in the teaching that he did with her. So, and my sense is that in his later years, he said he even said, "I don't want to have anything to do with politics. I just want to be a spiritual teacher." Mm -hmm. So I think he's trying to wash his hands of all that, but he's still, it's gone you know, so it went on for so many years, you know, right. And, so um, anyway, well, let's talk about the two documents that um, you and I um, uh, traded. Um, you um, uh, mentioned, uh, oh, you, you sent to me Marx and Buddha. A Buddhist Communist Manifesto by Jeff Waitzel, um, mm -hmm. and I sent you one by um, uh, Marx, Marxist and Communist Related Highlights from Dr. B. R. Amdekar's Summary of Buddhism, and a, he apparently he was a very well-respected Indian philosopher. He was a jurist. He was an anti-colonialist. And who lived from 1891 to 1956, and, and we so we shared the, these two documents, and and you are you are the you are the <laughs> much much more eminently qualified than I am. Uh, you know, we you and I had talked about um, you know uh, you know CPC members are by definition uh, bodhisattvas, and and you, you you talked about you know yin and yang and dialectics and Hegel and Mm -hmm. We've had a really nice conver We've had a really nice conversation. You also talked. To, uh, you may you may want to mention a book called The Tao of Physics. Mm -hmm. And uh, you and I also both agree that uh, Jesus uh, was a communist <laughs> because right. he, he 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 turned over the tables of the, uh, of, of, the, of the money lenders, of the bankers in the temple, and kicked them out, which is sort which is like kicking out the one percent of his time. Right and uh, which uh, which signed his execution uh, by Pontius Pilate. So anyway, just tell us, please talk about you know the the about uh, Doctor uh, and I and I and I actually have these uh, on the on on your page for the uh, interview so people can download them and read them. 
Mm -hmm. And um, so <laughs> please tell us about, you know, what they say about the um, harmony uh, and uh, commonalities between Marxism and communism. Right. Well, I think, um, you know, uh, I'll do my best because it's a very complicated oh, subject, know, yeah, and, you know, know. Um, but um, I'll say this, that um, the, the um, where um, communism and Buddhism differ so radically from Western idea and Western ideology and culture is that what they th conceive of as the self. And individualism is the prime directive of Western culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the collective society is, uh, is the prime directive of Eastern culture and also of communism because mm -hmm. Marx is basically saying it is, it is you know, it's the, the working class or it's the workers and peasants. It's not me, me, me. It's us, you know. Uh, how do we build a society? From a Buddhist point of view, um, although uh, Buddhism started off, uh, the Buddha was teaching individual liberation. So when you went to the Buddha, he would, he would give you instructions on how you could lead a better life. And he explained in his, his teachings when he, when he was alive uh, that uh, we're unhappy because of unhappiness or unsatisfactoriness is like, that's the basic, he calls it the first noble truth. And he said, but there is a way to get out of that first noble. There is a way to get out of that suffering. And that's to basically clean up your life on an individual level. Um, but as Buddhism developed, it became more, more inclusive. And also, let me just back up by saying that um, unlike uh, the Hindu society in the Buddhist time and going forward, there was no such thing as class or caste in the Buddhist community. So uh, the word in Sanskrit for community is Sangha, and you see the word Sangha in, in modern India even. Um, but in the Buddhist community, there is no such thing as, uh, as higher or lower. And, um, and also a key thing was they, they saw the danger of money, the attract, the, the, um, the um, attraction that money had, the, the temptation that money had for people. And so they basically said, if you're a monk, you don't touch money, period. Um, with lay people, it was different because these, with lay people, they said, look, you gotta, people need to make a living. You, we want people to be prosperous because you're helping the Sangha, you're helping the monks. So if you don't have any money, we can't continue. We depend on your support. <laughs> so please, you know, make money, be happy, but do it in a good way. Yeah. So um, don't sell insurance. <laughs> don't. Well, but you you can sell insurance. I'm you can just, sell insurance. I'm just yeah. I actually I have a friend. One of my one of my um, fellow monks from the Zen Center. Uh, after he left the Zen Center, he also became an insurance agent, <laughs> and. Uh, I, another guy I met, uh, not, not I met, it's, this is like a childhood friend of mine, a Jewish guy, because we went to the same Jewish summer camp. He told me that he's known a number of uh, former Zen monks or practitioners who were also selling insurance. <laughs> so, so now you see, you see the, the in, um, as Buddhism developed, from the idea of saving oneself, it developed to this idea of, no, you're not saving just yourself, you're saving all beings, idea of saving all beings. And the a bodhisattva, meaning a Buddha in training, so to speak, takes the vow, I'm the last one in, I'm like, I'm the captain of the ship, you know, everybody else into the lifeboats first, I'm the last one off the ship. That's what a bodhisattva is, and um, so the idea of a bodhisattva is that you're you're helping everybody in whatever way you can, 
and that's saving people. Out, that's straight out. That's straight out of the mouth of Mao. I mean, I mean he even talks Absolutely. about that. Communist Party members come last. You serve the people. You serve the community. You serve right. society. You sacrifice your your lifestyle <laughs> for the common good. So I mean, that's that's just. Right. That's, that's uh, from what you're saying. That's Buddhism and communism. Right. There, or at, that's, least Mao, at least Maoism. Well, and that's. But I saw you see that uh, in the Soviet Union as well. Yeah. Cuba. You know when Cuba. I mean, when yeah. I think of, I when I think of, I don't know that much about the uh, the war that Mao waged against the uh, the Japanese, but I do know about the war that. Uh, that Stalin and the Soviet people waged to free themselves from Nazism. And you, there's story after story of these people sacrificing their lives. They just say that my life is not important. We've got to get rid of these fascists. You know, they're destroying our country. And so my life is not important. These are like 20 year old kids. Yeah. Men and so, women. Young men. Men and, and women. Men and women. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it's a completely different understanding of what one's role in society is. It's not, it's not he who dies with the most toys wins. It's <laughs> all of us, you know, building a society together for everyone in the whole world. And so that's that's the the difference. Um, one of the, I, one of the, go just, ahead. Just a second, I just wanted to say there's there's a couple of books that I want to. Um, I want to bring to your attention. Um, there's an idea in, in um, even lay among lay Buddhists, that um, money is bad, and we should avoid it, and voluntary poverty, and so on. And that is a a, vi a, vi what's the word? a viable understanding, and we saw that in Amdekar, Dr. Amdekar's. Mm -hmm teachings where he talked about uh, he talked about that and also in uh, my my uh, monograph that I sent you where yeah, he talked about so right where he's talking about a uh, a community where people live with minimal you know they have like no possessions uh, it's everybody lives uh, minimal economic lifestyle so and Jesus and Jesus, Jesus, Christ, right. Jesus Christ was the same way. Yeah. Right, you, right. You give up all your, you give up all your material wealth and leave the right. leave the life of an ascetic. Right, right. So that's a common understanding. That's the understanding that I had had myself. Um, and um, but as I got older, I thought, you know, I'm not sure if this actually works. And um, Deng Xiaoping also had the idea. That that does not work, because mm -hmm. eventually people need to have a feeling. Prosperity is like a, it's a driving force in human nature. Um, they want their kids to be happy and healthy and have all the advantages and so on and so forth. So, um, so when Deng Xiaoping said to be rich is glorious, he wasn't saying, uh, I'm going to be rich at everybody else's expense. He's saying that by generating wealth, it will it will benefit all of society and flow through society, and society mm -hmm. itself advances. So, um, uh, so this book, I, I found this book called the, the Buddha's Teaching of Prosperity, and it's written by a monk, and uh, basically it talks about what the Buddha had to say to lay people, and he was and he was saying, um, you don't have to live in poverty. Um, you know, be successful in business, but when you do your business, if you have a business, pay your employees fairly. Do it, do it right. You know, and one of the basic teachings in Buddhism is something called right livelihood. That means that uh, if you want to become enlightened, don't do stuff that hurts people. Mm -hmm. You know, do stuff that helps people. Uh, use your use your your business activities in a way that actually helps people. So, um, and you see that happening in China as well, modern China, mm -hmm. where they, you know, they um, have businesses that help people. And, and Huawei, 
is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. they, they have great technology. It's a company that's owned collectively by its employees. Mm -hmm. this is, the largest this is, in the world, almost 200,000 employees. Right. And you know, you can't, so we, we can't buy stock in Huawei. Only the employees own it. <laughs> right, right. I know. I know. Damn it. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, there's another component of Buddhism which is called um, um, sympathetic joy, which means you don't envy people for their good fortune. You know, you're happy for them. Mm -hmm. So your daughter's working for Huawei. I'm very happy, <laughs> happy yeah, for yeah, yeah. Chara. So I don't, I don't begrudge that I can't buy stock. You know, there's other ways I can, you know, it'll be okay. Um, so that's one example. And there's another example which I wanted to bring to your attention, which is this book, which is one of my favorite books. This is called the Vimalakirti Sutra. And Vimalakirti, uh, this is a, again, this is one of these sutras that was written long after the Buddha died. And... He is saying, um, it turns out that, that he was a very, very wealthy lay person, the wealthiest guy, the most successful business person, but he also had very deep understanding of, of Buddhism, understanding of, of the way we can say. And he was so good that um, when the Buddha asked his disciples to visit him, they all said, well, we don't really want to visit this guy because he always asks us questions that we don't know how to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, uh, the, so the, this is a, not a very long sutra, but it's, it's humorous because he's making fun of the monks, uh, which is a good thing because they, that's another aspect. You don't want to have this hierarchy where these upper guy, upper class guys, they really know, you know, it's like the priesthood knows, you don't. Um, and, you know, Buddhism doesn't want any of that. And there's many examples in Buddhism where these lowly people come out of nowhere and they become great teachers. And in China or in Soviet Union, you have this guy who was a... Well, peasants. Was, Peasants who peasants. Who, who, peasants. Who, who read who read Marx and Lenin and Stalin and right. later well, Mao and and, and, be, and became and became great teachers in their communities. <laughs> well, and and uh, I just saw some guy whose his father was a, like a shoemaker or something, and his mother was a milkmaid, and he grew up and he was the first man in space. Oh, you're, you're, uh, Yuri Gagarin. Yuri Gagarin. Yuri Gagarin. <laughs> Yuri Gagarin. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, and th there's another woman I just heard a she she spoke about this. She was on uh, Regis Tremblay's channel, and she said she was she grew up in a very poor family, but there was some there was like a socialist aspect of the uh, of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society that allowed her to get an education, and she became a, a tremendous asset to society. So this is how, this is how um, Buddhism and communism, socialism, um, when practiced ideally, can make a, can totally transform a society. The, uh, you know, you talked about dung, but when you really think about it, you know, you know, 20th century's communist goals. I mean, Stalin wanted <laughs> a rich, a rich Soviet Union. Mao wanted a rich uh, China. I mean, they really worked hard at producing, you know, light industry and consumer mm -hmm. goods, and and um, and so this actually go, you know, <coughs> done kind of, done kind of, you know, tur turned loose the capitalist dogs, and and it caused a lot of problems, and maybe it was a necessary phase that China had to go through to uh, to sort of, you know, catalyze <clears throat> even greater wealth. But uh, they, they um, the 20th century communists uh, have, uh, have, I think, have been promoting, uh, I, I've never been to the DPRK North Korea, but I understand everybody has a house, everybody has medical insurance, mm -hmm. everybody mm -hmm. has a job, everybody has a free education from pre-K to post-doc. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> right. It's clean. It's clean, safe. <laughs> they have right. the Korean culture, <laughs> music, right. television, and uh, you know. So, uh, I, I think um, I think this idea. I know that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Amdekar, you know, was talking about dukkha. Um, uh, as, uh, for him, w uh, was a uh, a Buddhist word for. For poverty, but you're saying it actually means unsatisfactoriness. But um, I think we can agree that <clears throat> that whether you're a Buddhist or a communist doesn't mean you have to run around, you know, in rags and barefoot, and uh, mm -hmm. and that you can uh, be prosperous. Just live by the golden rule: don't do unto others what you don't want done to you. You know, that's the ethic of Confucianism and mm -hmm. Buddhism, and and um, Jesus Christ, uh, um, and I'm sure probably uh, probably I'd have to go back and read uh, some, but I'm sure Muhammad said the same thing. So I mean, the, right. these are not these are not these are not these are, this this is not um, <laughs> revolutionary, <laughs> dare I right. say. And well, uh, I think it's, said the same thing. You know, don't do right. unto others what you don't want done to you. Well, I think it's significant that. Um, who are the three, which are the three main countries that are standing up to Western hegemony? You know, Islamic Socialist Iran, mm -hmm. Communist China, and, the, and Russia, which although it's not, uh, it's not the Soviet Union anymore, it still has a large component of oh, social, huge, huge, social huge, aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, I call them anti-imperial. Mm -hmm. Right. It, yeah, I, I call Russia anti-imperial. Yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, and, and I and I have a sense. I don't. I haven't studied you know Russian Orthodoxy, um, but I have a sense that it has a a more um, universalist. Um, it's not individual. It, it doesn't. It hasn't taken on the kind of individualism of Western Christianity. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Um, yeah. What um, what about um, tell us a little bit about you know this is something else that um, this is something else that uh, Ambedkar talked about you know yin and yang and and you know yin right. and yang the balance uh, in in uh, Chinese uh, Buddhism and then um, uh, 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 Marxist dialectics you know two opposing mm -hmm. ideas and merging right. them to come up with a comp something that's workable and you also meant you also meant you mentioned that it had an influence on uh, hegel so do you want to say something about that please right right yeah i'm glad you you uh, reminded me of that um so uh the fundamental teaching of buddhism or one of the fundamental aspects you could say because buddhism is a is a it's not a philosophy, but it uses philosophical tools. And uh, one of those tools is the concept of non-duality, that there's, there is no fundamental difference between you and me, or inside and outside, and so on. So black and white, you know, these, those are dualistic concepts. You know, win-lose. In, 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 in the, our modern discussion, you know, they're always talking about win-win. You know, the Chinese are talking about win-win. Yeah. In America, it's in America, it's win-lose. See, this is dualistic thinking. Western Western society, Western mindset is all about dualism. They they're unable to, and and that reflects in lack of compassion or lack of em, lack of empathy. Whereas um, non-duality is rec is seeing the other in oneself. So you have uh, yin yang, where you see the black and the white, but mm -hmm. they're they're intimately connected to each other to balanced. make a whole, you know, balanced, balanced yeah, yeah. you know, to make a whole. So um, my sense of what happened is that um, as philosophy developed in the East and also spread into the West. Um, this idea of non-duality eventually seeped into Western philosophy. And that is how Hegel came up with his idea of the dialectic, where there's mm. a thesis and antithesis, and then they come together. Yeah. Um, 
to find to find it, some common ground. Right. It's um, it's more mechanistic, you could say, but I I would be. I would be surprised. I don't think that Hegel came out of nowhere. You know? <laughs> you know? They don't. These things they just don't pop up out of nowhere. So uh, my sense of it is that these I that as the West, as I mentioned to you in our email, I said imperialism is good <laughs> because if the imperialists hadn't invaded China and India they wouldn't have been exposed to the ideas of non-duality. <laughs> <laughs> so so that as they became exposed to non-duality, it gave them the opportunity to become enlightened and realize that what they're doing is really screwing everything up and that they better <laughs> get with the program and start to see things in a non-dualistic way. You yeah. know? And that's what, <laughs> Marx was, that's what Marx was trying to do. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I may be, you know, kind of uh, making a joke out of it, but I, I think that there is some element of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to expand a little bit further on this is the idea of causation. And again, in the West, we have a very mechanistic idea of causation. This happens and that happens and it's linear and so on and so forth. Um, as, uh, as the essay that I sent you uh, pointed out in something that I had, this, this is very um, critical in, in Buddhist thinking, is that there's this idea of the, they call it the Dharma Dhatu, that means the whole universe, the, all of phenomena, and they reflect each other, each thing reflects the other thing. So uh, instead of seeing in this very mechanistic way of, you know, the split between body and mind and so on, it's completely incorrect understanding. Everything, our whole body is connected, the universe is connected, society is connected, and uh, when you have that understanding, you have um, surveys in communist China where they, they don't want to lose sight of what something that won't get heard. If they don't get mm. heard, then the whole society loses because mm. they have an aspect of truth that is, uh, it's going to have an effect one way or the other. If it's not heard, then it causes problems. Mm -hmm. If it is heard, then you can deal with it. Mm -hmm. So, maybe so a this good, is maybe a, a good word in English is hol holicism, holistic. Holi holistic. Holistic. That's right. Hol yeah. Holistic. Uh, holistic that's right. A good way to look at it. So. Right. Uh, and um, and the Tao of physics, you know, talks basically is saying the same type of thing. That so book, the, Tao, the, the, the Tao of Physics, okay, the Tao of Physics, right. okay, all right. Well, I will put all, I will put all these books also on, on your interview page. And communists can be Buddhists, and Buddhists can be communists. <laughs> well, you know, as I, you know, I met, uh, I, I met this, I went to this very famous temple, and uh, one of the great Zen masters of China, it was... Uh, it was destroyed by earthquakes and neglect and so on. And then when the disciple of Xu Yun, that, that famous Zen master mm -hmm. I told you about, um, he, when he, um, at a certain point in his career, he went to Singapore and he said, hey, we really need to rebuild this temple. So he's the abbot of this very famous temple there. Uh, the, I have a picture on the cover of that book that I sent you. And he is a member of the Chinese assembly. So yeah, he's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. A, gover right. a government representative. <laughs> right. So he is a. So here's this. He's a Buddhist monk and a representative <laughs> of, the, the people, of the people. <laughs> people's people's assembly. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I met other. And I met a, a, at least one other person like that. So. Um, well, I'm sure. So this, I'm sure. I'm sure many communist members are Buddhists. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, maybe maybe lay Buddhists, but they're Buddhists. I'm sure that's right. true. China. Right, it's, right, exactly. It's got to be a fact. So, uh, right. I mean, when I was when I was in China, what was so incredible to me about China was as I was traveling around, I didn't have a lot of money. Um, uh, I was I had neglected my career, and I really didn't have a lot of money. And so I would go to these temples, and I would like I would hand the the monk some a donation from from my being there. 
And when he, hit, he would hand me an envelope back with <laughs> more money that I gave him. <laughs> this, this happened to me multiple times. The Chinese, the Chinese were so incredibly generous to me that I'm just, you know, I've, I, it's embarrassing. I realize how, <laughs> how, how boorish I was in many ways, you know. <laughs> they were just, they were so kind and so generous. It just blew my mind. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, that's amazing. So that's, that's communism, socialism, and Buddhism. <laughs> right, right, right. Generosity is one of the most important yeah. virtues that you can have in Buddhism and in Chinese culture, you know. And in Maoism, so, I mean, he, Maoism. He, he talked about, you know, being generous to prisoners, being generous, you know, to being generous to non-communists, being understanding to non-party people, being generous and forgiving to people who disagree with us. So, mm -hmm. you know, try to educate them. Don't try to don't don't beat them up. Educate them. So um, right, it's, right. It's it's all part of that, as you said, the uh, Dharma, da, whatever the that whole Dharma Datu. Down, down, holistic. Down to you, that, that holistic outlook on life. So uh, Right, right, right. Well, listen, man, this has been great. Not only are we good friends, great friends and comrades, and it's so nice to see you, uh, you know, you're, you're, we can, you know, talking to each other today. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully one day uh, we, w we will be able to go back and visit you and have a wonderful Thai meal and, and talk more about uh, communism and Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> right. So thank you so much. I will get this up, and hopefully you can blast it out to whomever you know. And uh, I'm okay. looking forward to uh, sharing this with everybody around the world. All right. Talk to you later, man. Okay, take care. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. China Rising Radio Sign to Land and China Tech News Flash signing out. Please make a contribution to all of my hard work. Thank you.